Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you here today for our lecture series on veterans. Uh, I'd like to recognize a couple of people in the audience. One, Dr. Hillary Miller, who is the director of the, the Veterans and Military Family Center here at Middle Tennessee State University, and also Dr. John Vile, who is the Dean of the Honors College. So we all welcome you here today for um, this part of our series. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Kenneth McLeish. Dr. McLeish earned his PhD at the University of Texas, Austin, and is currently Assistant Professor of Medicine, Health, and Society and Anthropology at Vanderbilt University. He also participated in our Spring 2014 Honors Lecture Series on Health and Happiness, so we're welcoming him back today. His primary area of research is how war manifests itself in the daily lives of U.S. military service members, their families, and their communities, a subject that he explores in his book, which is titled Making War, Everyday Life at Fort Hood, published by Princeton University Press. At Vanderbilt, Dr. McLeese teaches interdisciplinary seminars on war and the body, perspectives on trauma, the anthropology of healing, and the politics of health. He specializes in such topics as violence in everyday life, military medicine and mental health, soldier suicide, and the material and visual culture of war. Today, he will contribute to our ongoing conversation about veterans in his talk, which is titled, Imagining Military Suicide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McLeish back to campus. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Phillips, so much for that, uh, that gracious introduction. And uh, thanks to, uh, to all of you and to the, um, the Honors College for uh, uh, for allowing me to be a part of, uh, or for, for welcoming me back here, uh, and uh, and for allowing me to be a part of uh, of this semester's series, which is a um, a topic area and a subject that I really care a lot about, and I'm really pleased to be able to uh, contribute to here. Um, so, like you heard in that gracious introduction, um, I'm a a medical anthropologist, and I study the ways that war shapes and takes shape in the mental and emotional and bodily and interpersonal lives of the people who experience it and who are uh, impacted by it firsthand, which is to say uh, American uh, military service members, current and former, their families, their communities, and then the caretakers, care providers, uh, advocates, and activists who are also concerned with their care and well-being. Uh, and I'm particularly interested, like, um, like Dr. Phillips just mentioned, in the ways that uh, uh, that in that, sort of that shaping of life through war, uh, uh, medical and psychological categories are uh, come to, uh, to take on uh, a really significant um, importance. Um, and uh, uh, and I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a set of interests that leads me to this broader question of uh, what we can learn about how bodily and emotional experience um, tell us something about the bigger culture and politics of war violence. And so that's the context in which I'm approaching the, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about today, um, the, uh, uh, the phenomenon of, uh, of military suicide. Uh, this is a topic that I imagine uh, a lot of folks in the room have heard at least uh, a little bit, uh, if not a lot, about. Um, the military uh, suicide rate for as long as there is data for it, which is actually not terribly long, reliable data only goes back to I believe the late 1970s or early 1980s, uh, but for um, uh, for the last several decades, uh, the military suicide rate has historically been quite low, lower than a comparable age and gender-adjusted civilian population. But around the time of the beginning of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that rate began to rise. Uh, it increased significantly. Um, it surpassed the civilian rate. And uh, it is now a leading, excuse me, a leading cause of death for uh, uh, for military service members. Um, and uh, so, given this um, this kind of conundrum, it's also something that has occupied a, a, a lot of attention um, by the military itself, also by 
uh, the, uh, the Veterans Health Administration, and also become a major um, object of preoccupation and interest on the part of, uh, of the American public in general. Um, suicide is, uh, uh, has come to loom really large in the ways that we in the US at this particular moment think about the health and well-being of soldiers and veterans. And, uh, uh, and so uh, one of the things that I'm going to try to talk about today is exactly why that is and what we can, um, uh, what some of the consequences are of, uh, of the focus on suicide uh, and what, again, what it helps us understand about um, sort of broader cultural issues and political issues around um, death and war violence. Um, but in a more immediate context, I'm interested in the ways that the military as an institution, uh, and specifically the Army, because uh, as you heard, that's where my, uh, my field work was located at um, uh, Fort Hood uh, Army Base in Central Texas. Um, uh, I'm interested in the ways that the military responds to suicide, um, what these responses look like and feel like for soldiers, how they actually show up in people's everyday lives, uh, and then uh, uh, also, uh, like I said, how it is that this phenomenon of military suicide is represented um, in broader culture, how it is that, that we come to think about it and what sorts of uh, meaning and value we bring to it. Um, and another way of, of uh, kind of posing this question or describing it is to ask, what sort of story are we telling ourselves about the meaning and significance of military suicide when we uh, present it in particular ways, when we respond to it in particular ways? Uh, like most of what I'm talking about today is uh, based on research, the research that I conducted at Fort Hood in uh, 2007 and 2008, and then with some follow-up visits in 2009 and 2010. Um, I'm continuing to look at some of these issues uh, in a project that I'm doing uh, now with folks at and around uh, Fort Campbell, um, closer to, uh, uh, to, to uh, where we're at. Um, and, uh, uh, but the uh, the examples I'm mostly going to be talking about come from this earlier work. Um, and just to say a, a couple quick things about Fort Hood uh, to sort of put that in context, uh, it is uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, U.S. military installations. It was a home to about uh, 50,000 soldiers during the time that, um, that I was there. Uh, and it was the busiest point of deployment and return for uh, for U.S. forces overseas across the entire military, uh, but in particular for uh, 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 U.S. Army forces um, in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but actually mostly um, in Iraq uh, for the, the particular soldiers at Fort Hood. Um, and uh, so this is a place where uh, folks were deploying regularly and for very long periods of time, 12 to 15 months often with, le with uh, less than 12 months in between um, deployments. And it was a place where everybody's uh, daily life was in one way or another affected by, uh, by the ongoing war at the, the time that I was there. Um, so I'll get into the details of that in just a moment. But uh, first, I want to say a couple words quickly about um, what it means to look at suicide from an anthropological perspective. So we're accustomed uh, typically to thinking of suicide as a dysfunction or as a pathology. And uh, to look at it from an anthropological perspective doesn't mean throwing those, uh, those associations with it out, uh, but it does mean also trying to account for some other factors. Um, it, means, uh, it means trying to understand suicide as something that is culturally meaningful uh, in the sense that the act itself may be expressive of something, uh, uh, or at the very least, the fact that it occurs in a cultural context in which particular and specific significance is given to the, the act of self-inflicted death. Um, so suicide is something that happens across many, many different cultural settings. Uh, and uh, it, it is uh, in many different ways across many of those settings regarded as transgressive and as taboo. Uh, but the particular ways that people have of talking about it and labeling it vary tremendously from place to place to place. And the ideas about uh, what it means for a person to take their own life, uh, what it means for the people around them, for the societies that they live in, uh, uh, is a question that, again, that varies uh, considerably depending on context. And so, uh, so thinking about suicide not just uh, as something that is uh, dysfunction or a, uh, or a pathology, but also as an act that has, uh, that has meaning, um, 
uh, helps us to ask and hopefully answer some different kinds of questions about it from, uh, from what we're accustomed to thinking about. Looking at it anthropologically also means understanding uh, the, uh, uh, both the act of suicide and the kinds of things that people say about it, the way that they respond to it, the way that they talk about it or imagine it or understand it. Uh, it, means, it also means understanding those things as diagnostic of the structural conditions in which people are living. So when people talk about suicide, when they make judgments about it, uh, uh, when, they, when they try to, to measure it or intervene on it, they're talking about death. But they're talking about it from the perspective of a particular setting in which they are living, in which they and everyone else are living. So there's also a way in which, from an anthropological perspective, talk about suicide and representations of suicide are also a sort of commentary on what it's like to live, not only to die, but also uh, to live and to think about the value of life um, in uh, particular structural conditions. Um, and finally, and I'll say more about this uh, later, uh, later in the talk, um, but it's also, uh, uh, also from an anthropological perspective, we can, we're able to think about suicide not just as a phenomenon that exists objectively out in the world and we can develop increasingly refined ways of measuring and knowing it. Uh, uh, perspectives in anthropology and other disciplines like uh, the history and philosophy of science uh, encourage us to think about our knowledge of suicide as in part a product of our efforts to know and control it. Um, even the idea of a suicide rate or suicide as a, po as a phenomenon that happens in the context of a particular population or that we can link to particular risk factors or demographic elements, uh, th these things are a relatively recent historic invention. Uh, that way of thinking about suicide did not exist prior to uh, around the middle of the 19th century. Um, and I'll say more about that uh, a little bit later on, but I just want to emphasize for the moment uh, the way that we can, uh, that we can think about suicide uh, not just as uh, pathology, not just as dysfunction. Uh, we, can, uh, we can understand it as something that happens in cultural and structural context, um, even as uh, we regard it as something that we, uh, that we would want to struggle against, that we would want to try to prevent, that we would want to uh, understand the suffering behind. And in fact, hopefully asking these different kinds of questions about it can help us do that uh, in, a, uh, in a different and complementary way. So another uh, important piece of conceptual background is also to think about, uh, okay, so if, you know, if culturally intelligible action and structural conditions are important, well, what are those, uh, wh where does that cultural significance come from for folks in the military, uh, and what are, uh, what are those structural conditions? And I could talk about that stuff for a long time. That's uh, a lot of what uh, my, uh, my book project talks about. Um, but to put it really briefly, uh, we can understand those, uh, uh, those structural conditions as what we might call military biopolitics. Uh, that term biopolitics comes from the work of Michel Foucault, which uh, folks who have taken anthropology or sociology or a gender studies course maybe um, have, have come across. Uh, but what military biopolitics refers to is the set of mechanisms and regulations that manage and organize soldiers' bodies and minds. Uh, and these mechanisms and regulations keep soldiers alive, they care for them, uh, they make them into disciplined and useful tools. They engender particular capacities and abilities in them. Um, but they also, uh, they also empower them to kill. And, uh, and these mechanisms and labels also expose soldiers to harm on purpose, on a routine basis. And the, what the concept of biopolitics ask us, asks us to think about is that all of these mechanisms and labels are part of a single system. Uh, they aren't antagonistic. They aren't opposites. They, aren't, they don't just sort of incidentally intersect, um, they're all part of a, a single system that works together, which engenders these strange kinds of, of paradoxes, right? Because the kinds of uh, labels and interventions that are aimed at keeping soldiers alive and preserving and protecting them are part of the same, uh, the same uh, a set of mechanisms that is also exposing soldiers to harm in the first place. Um, and, uh, uh, and that on a cultural level, uh, for those of us, so biopolitics is something that structures people's everyday experience within military settings. But on a cultural level, uh, sort of moving beyond the military to think about how, uh, how we in American society think about military experience and think about soldiers, um, the, that 
sort of paradox of biopolitics continues to be important because it means that we as a society have these somewhat contradictory uh, or paradoxical attitudes about, um, about soldiers, about their well-being and their health, and about their relationship to violence. Uh, because we expect, on the one hand, we expect the military to keep soldiers healthy and well and intact at the same time uh, that we know that it is the job of the military to deliberately expose soldiers to violence. And we also expect the military to uh, cultivate in soldiers the ability to, uh, to exercise violence and to kill uh, as a part of their, uh, uh, their job and their professional function um, in the military. But we also expect of the military that it keeps that ability to kill, which in, in just about any other social setting would be tremendously transgressive and disruptive, uh, we, expect, uh, we expect the military to keep that ability to kill uh, sort of under control. And uh, suicide, military suicide exists in a really interesting relationship to, um, to this uh, set of problems, um, or this, this set of assumptions, rather, in that uh, it presents us with the problem of uh, this sort of pathological, out of control violence on the part of the soldier, and also it frustrates our expectation that uh, that the military um, uh, that the military is able to uh, uh, to keep the soldier safe and alive and intact. Um, so, uh, as we go along, I'll come back to uh, to some of these issues. But uh, for now, let me just um, let me move on to talking a little bit about uh, Fort Hood and uh, and kind of put a little bit of uh, ethnographic uh, meat on these, um, on these conceptual bones. So uh, during the time that I spent at Fort Hood, suicide was something that people talked about uh, a lot. It came up, uh, came up really frequently. Like I said, I was there, uh, most of the time I spent there was in 2007 and 2008. So actually in the middle of this, uh, this really dramatic rise in the suicide rate, uh, and also just to sort of put it in, in perspective now, uh, in the middle of uh, the war in Iraq, when the, that uh, there, was, there was no end of that war in sight, and uh, people's experience of the war was essentially as a sort of ongoing or indefinite uh, condition. Uh, but just about everybody I knew there spent time with new people who, uh, who had killed themselves or tried to kill themselves. Uh, uh, there, a fair amount of people uh, I knew described to me their own feelings of suicidality or their own struggles with it. Um, and there was a very real and very concrete sense that, uh, that the prevalence of suicide was directly linked to these kind of basic biopolitical conditions, the, the conditions of the ongoing war, the long and regular deployments, the stress of, of deployment and being in a combat zone, and so on. And so even, even just sort of at that level, uh, people's way of talking about uh, this, uh, this isolated and specific event or phenomenon of suicide uh, was, uh, was also inevitably sort of a commentary on the conditions that, uh, that they were living with as the war was going on. But at the same time, uh, there were some other interesting things going on. Uh, there, because there was also a strong sense among a lot of uh, uh, soldiers who I spoke with and spent time with and got to know that uh, the kind of anxiety about suicide, especially in the form of uh, of public pressure on the military to try to control this problem uh, uh, resulted in all these practices that, uh, that sort of seemed like um, overreach or overreaction on the part of the military uh, by, uh, by a lot of soldiers. Uh, there were all these ways that even uh, mentioning suicide, making a joke about it, making an angry or exasperated remark about it, um, uh, being, you know, saying something sarcastic or humorous could provoke a really kind of intense uh, official reaction. I mean, this is a, I, I work on a university campus. You guys are, you guys all spend your days on a university campus. This is not a, t a totally unfamiliar uh, phenomenon. Um, and I imagine, and, uh, uh, and it's, uh, but it's something that was, that was uh, really intensely present um, in the lives of a lot of the folks uh, I spoke to. And just to give one example, um, a, uh, uh, one of the folks I got to know there um, uh, told me this, uh, 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 told me a story about his, uh, his sort of experience with this phenomenon. Um, I refer to him uh, by the name Stuart, it's a pseudonym. Uh, he was a, a, a guy in his mid-30s. He was a sergeant who was originally in the, um, the, uh, uh, the National Guard and then uh, went, uh, went to the active duty army. Um, and he was uh, an 88 Mike, which is a truck driver. And his, uh, his job uh, during his multiple deployments to um, 
uh, to Kuwait and Iraq was to drive these very long, uh, tedious, and frequently um, quite dangerous convoy routes between uh, Kuwait and South and Central Iraq, sort of driving uh, fuel and supplies back and forth in these convoys. Um, and uh, it, so it wasn't a combat job, but it was a, it was a stressful and dangerous job. Um, there were frequent roadside bomb attacks and uh, uh, an occasional uh, ambushes or sniper attacks. Um, and, uh, and Stuart, actually, when I knew him after he had come back from his third deployment, uh, he'd been diagnosed with PTSD, with a traumatic brain injury from exposure to blasts, and with various orthopedic injuries from c climbing in and out of these big trucks and lifting heavy loads and stuff like that. Um, but during his third deployment, the thing that was really stressing him out was the fact that he was in the middle of a divorce, and uh, he and his soon-to-be ex-wife were having this terrible financial dispute. She was messing with all his finances. Uh, he told me she was taking all this money out of his account. Uh, she had power of attorney over some of his, uh, uh, over, over a bunch of his stuff, and uh, was sort of causing all these problems with it. She was selling things that belonged to him and emptying out his house and all this other stuff. And it was very, very difficult for him to deal with this problem from uh, you know, liter quite literally the other side of the world. Um, at his uh, uh, at the the base in, in Kuwait, where he was spending a lot of his time, and uh, uh, and so he became increasingly exasperated. He appealed to his uh, uh, first his squad leader, then his platoon sergeant, then his uh, uh, his first sergeant, and his commander uh, for help for dealing with this issue. And uh, no one could really give him help with it. It was a very stressful environment. Everyone was working really hard. Uh, it, it's not at all. It's um, uh, it's not usual or allowed that a soldier would be uh, would be permitted to go home for uh, for something like this anyway. Uh, but he felt like he was getting no help at all. And in the middle of a uh, an angry, tense meeting with his commander, uh, he uh, he made a remark along the lines of, uh, "I feel like I have to slip my wrist to get some help with this issue." And uh, and that was all it took. Within uh, 72 hours, um, he was uh, he was on a plane back to Texas. Um, and uh, as he remarked when he told me the story, it was like, well, I, I guess I'm not that bothered by it because it worked out for me. I got to come home. I got to deal with all this stuff. Um, but uh, but he wasn't. He he. According to to how he tells the story, he was not suicidal. Um, and uh, uh, and actually, somewhat paradoxically, uh, the. Uh, uh, the, in his medical record, it was stated eventually that he uh, that his suicidal tendencies were a his alleged suicidal tendencies were a product of the dangerous convoy route that he had been driving. So I share this story uh, for two reasons. One, because it gives a sense of the, the way that the different mechanisms that are a part of military biopolitics all kind of come together, sometimes in these perverse or um, uh, or surprising ways. Uh, so that the mechanism for that's that's meant to keep Stuart safe is also a way of sort of punishing or controlling him, um, uh, and uh, uh, and also because it allows us to uh, to see how this ang concern and anxiety ang excuse me anxiety over suicide um, in a military context uh, produces this sort of emphasis on control uh, on uh, on controlling the ostensibly or or actually suicidal person. Uh, but frequently at the expense of completely overlooking or ignoring other significant sources of stress and, uh, and endangerment uh, to soldiers. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, it, it's one of the things that I think is especially poignant about the story is the way that it was Stuart's home life that, uh, that, was, that pushed him to this intense uh, state of distress while he was deployed in a war zone. It was the war, the, the, uh, the war was stressful, the convoys were stressful, being deployed was stressful, but it was stuff that was happening at home uh, that really pushed him to this breaking point, at least in his account. And so um, it also kind of complicates how we might want to think about the relationship between war and combat and suicide as being a sort of a direct one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. Uh, but Stewart's story was just one of, uh, uh, of various accounts that, um, that I heard were kind of, that, that were kind of along these lines of these ways that efforts to prevent or police suicide um, kind of showed up in these ways that to soldiers and to the folks close to them seem, could seem punitive or intrusive or contradictory. Um, there were uh, various behaviors that um, in, uh, in some ways might be innocuous or in other ways might be problems in their own right or signs of all different kinds of problems, but that because of the very strong emphasis on surveilling and uh, preventing suicide, all got coded as, uh, as indicators of suicide risk. So these 
uh, these ranged uh, from things like socially withdrawing uh, to not showing up at formation, which is something that you can get in trouble in for a lot of reasons, but now one of the reasons is that uh, maybe you're a suicide risk. Um, uh, uh, failing to answer a phone call from another soldier, from a squad leader. Um, but then other things like uh, sort of stereotypical um, uh, macho soldier bad behavior, like drinking too much or fighting or driving recklessly. Um, uh, uh, also things that could be problems in their own right, could be signs of a range of problems, but they take on the special significance of being uh, seen as risk factors for, uh, for suicide and opportunities then um, or, or uh, obligations for uh, other soldiers and uh, uh, leaders, commanders, and doctors um, to, uh, to intervene. Um, and, uh, uh, and so just as, as kind of one example here, this is, a, um, this is actually, this large Im image is actually uh, uh, something that exists in the physical world as a sort of wallet-sized card. Um, and it's produced by the Army Public Health Service. And uh, at the, I picked up a couple of them when I was at, uh, at Fort Hood. And um, it's you know, something that would just be left out in piles next to you know, behavioral health pamphlets or, um, uh, or things like that uh, for soldiers to carry around with them. Um, but I include this just sort of as an example of the ways that this way of thinking about suicide uh, essentially enlists soldiers to monitor and, uh, and surveil one another's behavior and their own behavior. Um, and to, in the midst of these many, many different stresses that are basic features of their lives, uh, essentially imagine themselves and one another uh, as at risk for suicide in ways that, that potentially obscure uh, attention to many, many other kinds of problems that might be going on at the same time. Um, and along with this is also just the, the way that uh, these, uh, these suicide interventions um, also sort of depend on asking soldiers to be and to do things that, uh, that are in many ways contradictory to the nature of military biopolitics and to the nature of, uh, of military corporate culture that goes along with it. Um, this is a culture that emphasizes physical toughness and emotional fortitude and self-reliance. It emphasizes not complaining when you're hurt or when you feel bad or when you're crawling through the mud in, uh, in basic training or when you're crawling through the mud in a, a combat zone. Um, and it's also a culture that emphasizes uh, and prizes the ability to do harm and the ability to endure harm and suffering, again, without complaining. Um, there's a, a phrase that uh, uh, I heard from uh, a lot of uh, soldiers um, that they reported learning early on in basic training. Uh, if you get hurt and it's not life, limb, or eyesight, walk it off. Um, and this sort of injunction to toughness is part of what makes soldiers tough. It's part of what makes them disciplined. It's part of what makes them able to do the jobs that the military demands of them and that we as a society expect of them. Uh, but it also uh, gives rise to a, a corporate culture in which um, you know, if you are hurt and you seek help, you're frequently met with suspicion or, uh, uh, or contempt. Um, uh, including somewhat paradoxically, if you seek help for a mental health problem, uh, which is something that is both uh, that uh, around efforts around suicide in particular, uh, uh, mental health services are identified as the solution to suicide impulses, but also uh, having received mental health treatment services before is in some of these materials represented as a risk factor for suicide. Um, so it creates this, this kind of perverse um, uh, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy in which it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to in some way sort of not see oneself or imagine oneself as being at risk. Um, and, uh, uh, and so the thing I just want to emphasize here is that these are, are cultural features that emphasize these underlying dynamics of, uh, of military biopolitics, but that the scope of these kind of risk reduction interventions limits the, the factors that you can consider to strictly what's going on with uh, an individual person. And again, makes it difficult to look at these larger uh, factors. And all the while, the things that we believe make soldiers good soldiers also potentially make them risky, make them pathological, make them dysfunctional, unreliable, self-endangering, and so on. Um, and, uh, uh, and I just want to suggest, uh, as winding up through this portion of the talk, that addressing soldier suicide in, um, uh, in practical terms, I would argue, uh, also means confronting these, uh, these contradictions in military biopolitics and thinking about how our ways of thinking about military suicide don't always take very good account of those contradictions. <clears throat> 
So in the time that's left, I also want to say a little bit about the question of the suicide uh, rate. I mentioned at the beginning that the way that we uh, measure and uh, seek to know and control suicide is a major part of actually how, as a phenomenon, it becomes real uh, for us in contemporary times. Um, and in a lot of ways, the way that we think about suicide in contemporary times uh, is essentially as a, uh, as a number, uh, as a suicide rate, um, as a, uh, uh, an indicator of frequency within a population. And like I mentioned, this is not a way of, uh, of thinking about self-inflicted death that existed uh, until uh, around 150 years ago or a little longer. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, but it utterly determines the way that we think about suicide in, um, in contemporary time. So in, this, uh, uh, in this, this sort of collage of headlines here, uh, from a range of different news sources over the last couple of years, we can see that the central role that is played not just by the phenomenon of suicide, but by the rate itself, the frequency and the ability to, uh, to count. And then uh, by counting in increasingly refined ways, and not to diminish the, uh, uh, the, the tremendous knowledge and skill of people who do statistics at this level, it's something that's far beyond uh, my capacity as a, as a qualitative social scientist um, and uh, way, uh, way out of my lane. Um, but, uh, but that is essentially, uh, uh, essentially at root what this practice is, right? Is counting and, um, and understanding uh, relationships of frequency uh, between, uh, between events and populations. Um, uh, uh, this, uh, this sort of numerical representation of, of suicide strongly informs how we think about it. It's a, uh, so the number can go up and go down. You can compare the number to other forms of death, like you know, for instance, comparing it to combat deaths. Um, which, it, uh, uh, which it exceeded in, uh, in 2011. Uh, you can sort of split up the military population into different categories, be it active duty versus guard and reserve or, uh, or other things like that and make comparisons within the population. Uh, and also you can, uh, in case you can't read this last uh, headline, it says DOD releases suicide event report and changes reporting methods. Uh, you can also just pay attention to the way you are counting, um, which, uh, which is itself a very significant uh, issue because until quite recently, um, military suicides were counted uh, uh, according to a, a DOD wide, uh, so across the different service branches, um, single uh, uh, program um, that only counted uh, service members as long as they were still in the service. So there was actually, uh, there's actually no way of counting uh, recently separated service members uh, or uh, service members who were X number of years out. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but the question of counting uh, exactly how you, how you count and how you measure matters tremendously. Um, but uh, what I want to suggest all of this does is, uh, is again, invite uh, uh, soldiers and service members, invite uh, the military as an institution, and invite all of us to imagine who is and who isn't uh, at risk, and that this too is a big part of the meaning and significance that we assign to the phenomenon of uh, of suicide, but what it um, uh, what really sort of drops out of the picture is anything that is not captured by the relatively narrow sets of demographic factors that it's possible to measure at the population level. So it tells you nothing about individual suicides, and it also uh, can be very difficult for it to tell you much about the ways that many different factors might be working together uh, to contribute to an environment in which uh, in which someone chose to uh, to take their uh, uh, their own life. Um, so uh, let's see. So as far as the suicide rate goes, uh, of course the um, the the expectation uh, the expectation of the army itself and of um, uh, uh, civilian culture more broadly uh, was a lot like the the expectation of the folks who I spent time with at Fort Hood, namely that the relentless pace of the wars, these really long and difficult uh, deployments, um, uh, produced uh, a, an increasingly stressful um, situation in which uh, it, uh, and, that, and that that stress was manifesting itself as um, as an increased rate of suicide. And this quote is from uh, General Peter Chiarelli, who. At the time, oh, I'm not going to remember the name of his position at the time, but he was responsible for writing a couple of really important uh, mental and behavioral health reports in 2010 and 2012, and he continues to work uh, 
uh, in, this, uh, in this area in the Defense Department. But he's saying uh, these ongoing stresses have pushed uh, some units, soldiers, and families to the brink. So even within the military, the narrative is this relentless schedule of deployments is what is driving suicide. Going to war is creating stress, and that's what's, uh, that's what's driving suicide. And so it was then uh, uh, rather uh, surprising that a couple of recent uh, studies, and these, the first of these came, actually came out in 2013, but the most, uh, the most recent one came out uh, back in the spring of this year, um, when uh, a couple of recent studies came out that, uh, that sort of defied the expectation that there were direct um, demographic population level links between, uh, between deployment or uh, frequency or length of deployment uh, and, uh, and prevalence of suicide. Um, so uh, uh, this the uh, one uh, uh, oh, sorry and so one of the um, one of the interesting results here was that military suicides actually turned out to look a lot like uh, civilian suicides. There were there were no links um, uh, uh, or there were the, the the expected links between length and frequency of deployment, uh, but also the expected links uh, between uh, things like uh, traumatic brain injury or PTSD diagnosis did not show up in the data in the ways that people expected. Um, and uh, so the, this most recent study, this one that was published in early 2015, is interesting and important because it was one of the first uh, studies to put together military data with data from a number of other sources to be able to track military populations and see what happened to them after they actually left the military. Uh, and that was, that was part of what allowed um, these, uh, these new analyses. Uh, and it replicated other uh, findings that, um, that had discovered somewhat puzzlingly that there was a high proportion of suicides among service members who had deployed only once or not at all. And this is in a situation in the Army where there is not uncommon for folks to deploy three or four times, uh, sometimes even more, depending on how long uh, they stayed in the service. Uh, but, uh, but for some reason, suicides were, uh, were concentrated in folks who who only deployed once or who, who never uh, went to war in the first place. Uh, and so that was rather puzzling. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it presents these questions of, all right, well, so how, how should we measure this phenomenon and how should we try to understand it? Um, and I want to uh, suggest just a couple of things about this. Uh, one is to think about the way that, uh, that uh, here too, individual experiences of uh, suicide and, diff and uh, different ways that stresses might combine are kind of disappearing into the statistics. Uh, and what, the, uh, what the, um, uh, the study actually found is not terribly well reflected by the wording of these, uh, these headlines. Because of, this, of the, uh, uh, the suicides that were um, uh, discovered or measured in this survey, about 30% of them were among folks who had deployed one or more times to a war zone. Uh, so to say that there, to suggest that there is then no link at all, uh, is somewhat mystifying. When thirty percent of suicides were folks who had been to a war zone, um, but uh, uh, but also I want to suggest here too that part of the problem might be just a failure to uh, uh, to have a way of measuring that accounts fully for the complexity and contradiction of military biopolitics, uh, and the part of that, uh, and, and we can think back to somebody like Stewart. Um, someone with multiple deployments, multiple sources of stress uh, from combat, uh, from uh, uh, work-related stress that was not necessarily a part of, uh, uh, that was not just specific to being in a war zone, stress in his personal life. Um, and uh, uh, for him, combat and deployment were one among many stresses. Uh, but it was also hard, it would also would be hard to, uh, in his account, to disaggregate all those stresses from each other and to say which one is the most important or would, you know, would one exist if the other weren't also there. Uh, and it's also the case that, uh, uh, that deployment, um, which is to say the, the aggressive operational tempo of the military, affects far uh, more folks than just the people who are sent to war. Uh, remember that the military is a massive, massive institution um, that includes many, many people who work uh, here in the US, who are deployed to posts in the US to do, uh, to do work in support of, uh, of deployments overseas. Uh, and in fact, in 2013, uh, a National Institute of Mental Health uh, survey discovered that accidental injury and death among non-deployed personnel, people who never went to a war zone, 
had increased in similar proportion to suicide over the course of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and so uh, another thing that we might think in response to these headlines that seem to say, oh, there's no link between war and suicide, is to say, well, actually, perhaps we need to expand our imagination of what constitutes war, our imagination and understanding of where the activities of making war uh, take place and what they entail, um, and the ways that they, can, that they can kind of reach beyond uh, war zones and reach beyond factors that uh, might otherwise seem sort of military specific. So as a brief uh, coda, I also just want to say something uh, about uh, suicide that happens after uh, military service. Um, I've been talking about uh, suicide management within the military, but of course veteran suicide is something that has also received uh, uh, a lot of attention over the last couple of years, um, not least in the very frequent invocation of, uh, of this, uh, this um, uh, grim and frightening statistic that there uh, are on average 22 veteran suicides a day, um, according to, uh, to some estimation, even higher. Uh, and I just want to point out uh, to ask the, uh, to, to sort of pose some of the same kind of um, persnickety deconstructive questions uh, about this statistic as I have about um, the, the other uh, figures I've been talking about. I just want to point out uh, the fact that there are 21 million veterans uh, in, in the US, give or take, um, and around uh, uh, three and a half or four million, I believe, of them are folks who served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and so it, this is a giant, tremendously diverse population. And, uh, uh, and this statistic of, of 22 a day, which does reflect an alarming trend and prevalence, also conceals tremendous diversity within the population of veterans. There are numerous populations within the broader veteran population who are, uh, especially, who, who are at especially elevated risk of suicide. Uh, and uh, a lot of those groups are folks who didn't necessarily deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, uh, it includes uh, a lot of older male veterans. Uh, it includes uh, 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 Native American veterans are, especially, uh, are, are at especially high risk of suicide. Um, uh, survivors of sexual assault, uh, both men and women uh, veterans, are, uh, are also a particularly high risk. Um, and uh, some of the things that appear to place people at elevated risk of suicide may not have directly to do with, uh, uh, with their war experience or with their military service, but it also doesn't mean that they have nothing to do with their military service either. Um, and, uh, and so with this, with this statistic, too, I would like to suggest that we can perhaps put this question of war-related versus non-war-related suicides, um, uh, respond to that by putting military service itself in social and structural and cultural context, uh, and to think about the other forms of, of harm that potentially are interwoven with it or that intersect with it. Uh, and then I, I would also just like to suggest perhaps that focusing, uh, that, that we might, we might want to ask ourselves whether focusing uh, uh, only on suicide is the best way to think about uh, uh, veteran health and well-being. Um, there, uh, uh, there are a ton of different uh, uh, mental and physical health challenges and sort of quality of life challenges that are uh, faced in, in many, many different ways across uh, the contemporary veteran population. And uh, to talk about the 22 a day is certainly to convey a strong sense of urgency uh, about, um, about some of the problems that are confronting veterans. Uh, but it may also, uh, we may also sort of in the course of that uh, find ourselves running the risk of literally reducing veteran experience and veteran health to a statistic. Um, and uh, a, a colleague of mine who's a, a social worker at the VA um, I was talking to him about this uh, uh, a couple months ago, and he said, you know, suicide intervention and prevention is easy. Uh, it's, uh, like, it's serious, but it's easy. If someone says they're suicidal, you intervene, you get them to talk to someone. Um, trying to figure out what else is going in their, on in their life that is, uh, that's causing problems for them and trying to figure out the root of those problems, that is really difficult. Uh, and so, again, just thinking about uh, sort of how that that focus guides us. Um, so really quickly, by way of conclusion, um, uh, just uh, thinking about the way that um, 
the structure of military biopolitics and then our cultural anxieties about the nature of, of war violence and military death can potentially distract us from thinking in more productive uh, uh, ways about what the nature of, of suicide is. Um, some things that, uh, that can potentially clarify the picture, uh, better data, more accessible data that's more accessible to more researchers. A lot of this, the data sets are, uh, are um, uh, tightly controlled and they're, because they're, uh, they're controlled by, uh, by government agencies and it's difficult for researchers to get access to them. Uh, but also a better sense of context uh, for, for where, uh, where these events are happening. Um, and uh, better attention to other problems that, uh, that veterans are also confronting and struggling with. And then in the course of that, we might also ask what other kinds of evidence or expertise or stories you know, beyond uh, uh, numbers going up or down in a newspaper headline uh, help us to put uh, suicide in context and hopefully uh, understand it better. And uh, uh, I'll conclude there. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. McLeish. Um, very informative talk, and you've raised a number of important questions about veterans' health and the, the complexity of, of the whole issue of veteran suicide. Um, we have some time remaining, so I would encourage any of you with questions to, to pose your question to the speaker. Yes? Um, are you familiar with um, a man named uh, Lieutenant David Grossman? <laughs> I believe he published at least two books, one uh, called On Combat, one titled On Killing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe like in the, at least in the book called On Killing, he studies like you know, the history of military training and makes the case that after the Second World War, there was a revision in uh, basic combat training, which tries to place more of an emphasis on motivating soldiers to kill. And in his, in his books, Lieutenant Grossman was trying to lay out you know, the intended and unintended consequences of these uh, tr uh, training ideas for our uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, have, have, have you read them? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with, uh, uh, with On Killing, yeah. Do, 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 you, do you think that it's, do, 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 do you think he's on something? Do you try, try to understand? Uh, it's a, let's see, so it's a, uh, uh, well, actually, uh, could, would, could you say a word or two about how um, how we might think about how how you think uh, uh, Grossman could uh, could shape how we think about military suicide? That is to say that um, you, you mentioned you, there was a slide showing the training at Fort Benning, and of course the, the whole idea of training you know, is the training to endure pain, to ignore hardship, to you know dismiss you know whatever harm comes to physically. And at the same time, of course, they, they are trained to to kill and mm -hmm. to, to want to you know, and the eye on the enemy. And I think, I think what Lieutenant Grossman was, was his idea was that, and the, I, particularly in Vietnam and in the recent wars, the, a consequence, one of the side effects of the training has been uh, any increase in uh, post-traumatic stress and the, the risk of suicide. In soldiers coming coming back from a war with you know, memories of mm -hmm. things that they yeah, have done, or things that have been done to them, or things that they have seen done to their buddies. Sure. Yeah. So um, the. Uh uh, so Grossman makes a very particular argument, which, is, which as you pointed out, is that there, uh, there was a, a sort of uh, a specific and significant change um, uh, in, the, in the wake of, uh, of World War I um, uh, and, uh, and some of these, uh, these World War II studies also trying to figure out, um, uh, how, again, yeah, like you were saying, how to, how to discipline and, uh, and motivate soldiers. Um, there, are, there are other accounts of uh, kind of the modern history of military discipline and uh, and training soldiers to kill and under and thinking about what it means to train soldiers to kill that take kind of a different timeline uh, so that um, you know so that we can go back to uh, the the mid to late nineteenth century uh, or even earlier and read about practices of military discipline that were uh, that were bent on um, controlling and regimenting soldiers' behavior and action and um, uh, and uh, uh, and also on on sort of uh, validating the act of killing, motivating them to kill, and uh, attaching um, cultural value to 
uh, to that, the act of killing in military service. Um, and so I think uh, the, the, some of the arguments that Grossman makes are really, um, are really compelling. Um, I also think that there's some interesting evidence for suggesting that we expand that, um, that analysis uh, along a much longer timeline. Um, and uh, uh, so that uh, we might say that the, the kinds of experiences that soldiers have had um, in the recent wars or in a war like Vietnam, uh, that in some ways those are, uh, maybe some of those experiences are qualitatively different from some experiences in previous wars, but in other ways they're actually relatively continuous or con um, uh, uh, contiguous with and similar to um, experiences of modern wars going back uh, uh, to even before the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I, I say that not just because it's a question of historical uh, accuracy uh, to say, you know, oh, Grossman says this change happened here, uh, but actually it happened much earlier. Um, uh, I think the, the implications are potentially a little bit bigger because uh, it, uh, it might actually suggest that there are things fundamental to the nature of modern warfare itself not to some like relatively recent change or way that we decided to train people after World War II or something like that, but there are implications of the nature of modern warfare itself that subjects uh, soldiers um, in their bodies and in their, uh, in their minds and in their sense of self to these particular paradoxes and, uh, and contradictions. Um, and that, uh, and if, we, if we take that perspective, um, then that also uh, sort of confronts us with different questions about what the solution uh, might be to alleviating some of these, uh, uh, these sources of, of distress. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of a, that's maybe a long non-answer to your question, um, but, uh, and, uh, but I, I thank you for asking it, and it, it definitely it points to a really uh, important issue. Do any branches have a higher suicide rate than others, and if so, why? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, the uh, uh, the army has the highest uh, suicide rate of um, uh, of all of the service branches, and uh, the Marines uh, have the the second highest rate. Um, and actually, if I were to ask you guys to just do a little like speculative epidemiology on the spot. Uh, could anyone hazard a guess as to why uh, or what a reasonable explanation for that might be? Uh, the ones that's immediately involved in combat, it's the most visible. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so the question, so some fo folks up here said uh, deployment time and deployment rate and, uh, and the nature of the work. So the Army is the, uh, the biggest of the service branches um, by quite a significant margin. The Marines are actually the smallest. Um, uh, but uh, the Army and uh, uh, Army and Marines uh, uh, combat arms branches are responsible for uh, essentially you know all of the ground combat in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Army personnel and then some logistical support personnel from other service branches, but mostly Army personnel are responsible for the bulk of all the other boots on the ground stuff um, happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and then, yeah, and then there's also the question of length and frequency of deployment. And actually, the Army far outdoes all the other service branches in terms of how long it deploys people for and how frequently um, it, uh, it deploys them. I mentioned at the very beginning that typical Army deployments uh, at the height of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were 12 to 15 months. Sometimes they're even longer than that. Uh, there is supposed to be a mandated minimum of 12 months that you get to spend at home. Um, uh, in between deployments, but there are all kinds of reasons that that could get compressed or taken away or taken up with training or whatever. So there are very, very long periods of time um, that people were deployed for and on a repeated basis. Uh, uh, Marine um, combat arms folks were also uh, uh, deployed um, uh, frequently, but their tours are usually, I believe, six to nine months long, uh, and they typically also uh, were able to get uh, uh, longer dwell time at home in between um, deployments than was the case for some folks in the Army. Um, and so uh, it's a great question uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is the way that this is a structural feature of these institutions and that deployment schedule was a policy decision, right? It was a decision that said uh, we need to send this many, you know, to fight this war we need to send this many people for this amount of time um, and repeat it this many times. And uh, 
uh, and so, you know, it's not, it's no, it's nowhere written in stone that that's the way it needed to be, right? That that was the the length of time that people had to go for, how frequently they had to go, uh, and so it's a, that that uh, question also sort of directs our attention to the structural context for the kinds of stresses that um, that folks are uh, are confronting. Very good. We are out of time, so please join me in thanking our speaker once again. Thank you, guys.